Hello, hello. Good day. We are live. It is October 3rd. I can't believe we're already in October. Goodness me. Um, Jesse, it is great to be here to see you now that you are officially unemployed and nearly homeless. I am excited <laughs> that you have chosen to join me on this journey to the unknown. Uh, I'm super excited. But I know I say this every week, y'all, but I cannot express my level of joy for this show. Um, no pun intended, because a joy did bring Cammy and I together. But, um, but my level of joy is through the roof right now uh, for our guest today. And I cannot wait for you all to get to know her, uh, just hear from her. And, um, and so anyway, she is a neuroscientist. And for anyone that knows me or follows my stuff knows that this is like, I just, oh, I'm in, I'm in heaven right now. So anyway, Jesse, uh, what's the word, man? What's, what's new with you? What's going on? Well, aside from you fangirling right now, and but you've been fangirling about <laughs> our guest for quite some time, yeah. and uh, I actually got to see her in action. I don't think she knows it yet. I was in the in the in, when we're putting our school in, but we'll get to that. So, yeah, I I, uh, I woke up kind of feeling different this morning uh, because, as Joe mentioned, I am no longer a San Antonio police detective, and that is kind of surreal, and also liberating uh, at the same time. So I'm excited. Um, I did. Uh, have my first moment of wow uh, last night. Um, but I think that was also alcohol induced and a social media post write up that kind of forced it um, because I hadn't felt anything the entire time other than uh, nervousness about the future. But yeah, I had uh, I had my goodbye moment, but we'll get into that later. Um, why don't you introduce us to our cool and fascinating new guest today? Yeah. So Jesse, what I haven't told you and it was on purpose is and i'm gonna let cammy introduce herself way better but here's what i'll say is whenever i've in the last month or so that i've been very privileged to work with her on some things uh, and when she does her introduction i'm always like man that is incredible like what a cool background to be like educated in lying and cheating oh, yeah. and i was like oh man i can't wait for you to meet jen <laughs> So anyway, Cammy, why don't you <laughs> tell us just a little bit about who you are, what you do, and, and your background? Thank you so much, Jesse uh, and, and Joe. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with both of you and, and actually learning. Congratulations, uh, both of you, for uh, embarking on a very new uh, chapter of, of, of your life, just weeks apart, right? So it's yeah. kind of like you are twinning in, in that in that in, in that department. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm a uh, thank you so much for for bringing me in. I'm really thrilled, and we've been getting to know each other for the last maybe two months um, through the work on uh, that that we are working together um, about de-escalation, and it's linked directly to my to my expertise. I'm a social and cognitive neuroscientist by training. I started my journey with. Uh, understanding how the brain works and what is behind the things that we do, uh, why we are irrational when we really think that we are very rational on objective, why we do the things we do, why we think the things uh, uh, we think. And I started with looking at uh, uh, how people lie and cheat and what happens in the brain uh, when they do that. And this is what uh, Joe is alluding. So I've spent quite a few years on um, uh, looking into the neuroscience of human deception. And while I really, really love the um, field, I actually realized that after quite a few years of being lied to every day <laughs> by my experimental subjects and me being forced to, uh, to some extent, to deceive them about the experimental setting, I kind of had enough of, of lying and, and deception for a little bit. I wanted to take a break. I, and I moved to the, um, to the United States um, where I was looking at risk-based decision-making in social situations. And I was working with uh, healthy populations, but also clinical populations, meaning people suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder, addiction, depression, and looking at how they, these two populations differ in ways we make decisions and how we can actually uh, manipulate or offset some of them, change some of the risk preference preferences that we have based on the feedback that we get from people uh, in our circles, either friends or, or strangers. Um, and that kind of led me to, uh, I spent quite a few years in academia and I left academia about four or five years ago at this point. Um, well, I just want to curious, where'd you, where'd you teach at? 
Uh, I was, I was, uh, my uh, doctorate, uh, um, my grad, I graduated from uh, Aarhus University, so I did my PhD in Denmark and in England. It was a combined program when I was looking at the, the deception part of humanity. Uh, and then I, I did two postdoctoral trainings, one and what was at Rutgers University, and the other one was at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where I was working with the psychiatry populations primarily. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. And then I kind of, uh, I always knew that I really wanted to work um, with more translational aspect of my of my research and, and kind of apply my expertise much closer in time than what you can do uh, generally in academia. It, it takes a lot of time. By the time you do the experiment, analyze it and publish it, it, it takes a few years and there is not that much uh, immediate application to uh, of the research and expertise that you can you can use. And it kind of made me move a little bit of my focus to what, what I can do in the real world, so jumping off the ivory tower of academia uh, to the to the world of consulting, and that's how I joined my current uh, organizations. I'm at the Neuro Leadership Institute, and I work use my expertise. I, I kind of function um, in a slightly like an octopus style. I have my hands in anything and everything when it comes to uh, um, to science. So I I work on translating and and teaching science and the findings from science, translating those into very simple, actionable ways that lay audience can just take it uh, as nuggets of information and use it in a practical um, environment, primarily in the corporate uh, world um, when it comes to managing human capital and, and embarking on behavior change at scale, meaning at the whole level of the entire organization. So that's that's where I am right now before we jump into how we know with uh, how I know Joe. Joe, would you like to tell us or shall I carry on with my uh, with, with my I just, I just want to check in and see if anyone else is feeling bad about themselves because right. you've accomplished all of that and you're only like 37. And so <laughs> I think that's like three lifetimes of work. And so good for you, Cami, yeah. for just this constant pursuit of discovery is, you know, I mean, I think that's what science is, is just uh, always learning. And, and I think it's great that, you know, for us, I think, you know, science intimidates a lot of people if it wasn't their like strong suit. Um, and I think as we get older and we become curious, which is what I am, you know, I was never a great science student. Um, but as an adult now, who's had a lot of pain and a lot of trauma, I've become very curious about like the psychological component of um, just human behavior and like why people think the way they think and feel the way they feel and then do the things they do and so for you to be able to take all of that and then turn it into these like like just very small relatable um things that can improve people's lives i think is is very profound so thank you for that i have i i have so many questions i <laughs> I, I do um but i i just want to touch on one thing and that's the fact that um you found that that social science research takes a long time, right? Just to conduct the, the studies themselves, then to put the writings together, then to get them peer reviewed, and, and then to get accepted in the paper, right? And then, then it gets circulated around. And what I learned um, is that, and you, you mentioned it, how long it takes for all of the, you know, uh, applicability or the, you know, what what the science could mean to actually translate to the real world is was, uh, it just took too long. And, and uh, I love that you said, you know what, I want my science to, to affect change. And a lot of the stuff you talked about was based in modifying behavior. Um, and that's like the real thing. And that's what Joe and I, I love so much. So I thought that was really cool. Um, but yeah, um, I could go on and on because now I will like, just hearing about your study, I want to get into the research methods, like how would that study even be conducted? But Settle so, down, Jesse. Yeah, I, well, that's a discussion for another time. That's now sure. why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but go ahead. Rain them in. Got rain them in. So uh, anyway, no, I think I think uh, you're doing great, Cami. So uh, I, I alluded to it, and then she just touched on it as well. But uh, you know, through our partnership with uh, Joy Verplank and Milo Range, um, you know, we 
started chatting several months ago. And then through that relationship, Joy was like, hey, you should uh, meet this incredible human being, Cami Sip. She's brilliant. She's really, really great. And you should meet her and see. And so we did. And then we actually, through the, the de-escalation training that she uh, created, we kind of tested it at one of our schools in, in uh, Louisiana. And it really went great. I mean, the feedback was so positive and comical, uh, which is kind of what we expected only because I remember this one guy, he said, he goes, wait a minute, you know, she's up there talking about prefrontal cortex and the amygdalas. And I didn't even realize I had those. So it was good feedback though, right? Cause it was like, Hey, we have to really think about uh, when we're going to deliver a training like this, like really bringing it, that's not to be offensive, but just bring it down to, um, a very basic level so that people aren't lost in the weeds of like, what the heck did she just say? Uh, so it was, it was funny. It was good feedback though, but can we tell us about that training um, and kind of where it came from? Yes, absolutely. So I think that uh, I, I, I always, whenever, whichever engagement I'm, I'm doing, whether it's teaching, I, I, I um, adults, uh, in in our in, in my work at the organization or developing a a training uh, or an engagement briefing um, for other other populations, I always think about how to make science not scary because a lot of the times exa exactly when you say oh this is a neuroscientist or we're going to talk about the brain, I would react the same if somebody comes and tells me we are going to discuss physics. <laughs> Like this is something that I would rather not uh, necessarily. I would be uh, shy in the in the back of the room, so I can relate to some of the intimidation of the terms. Uh, but at the end of the day, making science approachable and making it as simple as possible, whether it's using metaphors, whether it's it's uh, using different ways of saying the same thing, is the is the the only way to communicate to large audiences. And also thinking about how to communicate the concepts to somebody who is sitting at a table with you at a dinner you i wouldn't go and discuss the methods the the significance the the statistics because they would just go to sleep really really fast so i'm i'm usually thinking about either cartoony version of describing the the processes or different metaphors but at the same time i also try not to dumb it down or water it down because i think that it still can be translated and explained in a way that is relatable without making it incorrect because uh, like i am a diehard scientist i have brains all over my <laughs> my apartment when i teach and also like i really like to connect to the to the reality of what we are dealing with and the um, program that, that you are that you are referencing is the neuroscience of de-escalation our organization um, decided to do a free uh, briefings for law enforcement throughout the end of the year on the science behind the escalation and kind of teach and and uh, spread awareness about what is that we that that is actually that we are referencing when we think about the escalation and for me I kind of went back to the basics right at the get-go thinking like when so what is escalation like what is that we actually dealing with when we think about de-escalation we first need to understand what escalation actually is and come back to the basics the the psychology the physiology that we are experiencing as human beings I, I think that that's the one of the key lens with which we are uh, I'm also approaching any anything that I do in my professional life is thinking about what is the human factor, the, the connecting uh, tissue between two people, and that it all comes back to the same kind of a software and the, 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 the reactions that we have is going to be very, very similar, but it shows up very different depending on the context. So the law, in, law officer, uh, discussing something with a civilian, there is already a, a dynamic that is that is kind of becomes scary. Just like thinking about the oh, I'm going to learn about the brain. So it's just the context depends on how we how we're going to approach this. And in the process of development, I met I met uh, Joy uh, as you mentioned already, and she was really really kind, and she set me up. Um, to try some of the Milo simulations. And that was definitely an eye opening for me, I think as a civilian to, to think about the speed of the reactions that the officers needs to go through, the types of procedural and legal um, thinking and, and consideration that you need to take all the time whenever you are interacting with another person and also bringing it back to the science that I know whether it, that's like uh, thinking about the threat response that we all that we all uh, have the the biases the the level of threat that we will be experiencing and how to bridge the, those worlds together so it's still 
um, informative, but also without scaring the law officers being like, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to learn about the intricacies of the hormonal uh, discharge when, 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 I'm, when I'm stressed. So I, I had to lift up. And that's where when Joy and actually Joe, you as well, uh, pulling back me a little bit from like, okay, we are not going to talk about this. Let's lift up was very, very useful. And that's the, the connection I think that I really enjoy, not only learning the background of what is what is the population that I'm dealing with, that I'm trying to, to, to tell uh, a different story to, but also uh, the combination and the partnership is extremely important. I think that's the only way to actually bridge the gap because if I just came as a neuroscientist and read, have my spiel and talk about behavior without actually understanding the other person be on, on the other side of the table or uh, behind, the, behind the camera, then that would be quite uh, probably showing up flat and, and not relatable. So the combination of you and me and Joy working together uh, has been extremely, not only a great learning experience for me, but also the partnership that I think that can bridge some of the divides and the gaps and, and make it more relatable um, in terms of connecting the, the dots between behavior and the brain and the impact that it has. Yeah, and I just, I had an experience that the officer had sitting in the class the first time you taught this because I'm still stuck on hormonal <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but it excites me. Uh, we have a question for you, Kevin. Yeah, speaking of policy considerations, so what application right. does your work have to the area of addiction or policy application? I should say, uh, government programs, medical, hospital, law enforcement, treatment programs for incarcerated men and women. Yeah, so I no longer work in, in academia and, and in, in, in addiction. Um, right now, in, in the organizations that, that I work, we actually. Um, we don't tailor specifically for specific groups when it comes to mental disorders per se, because when it comes to uh, some of the key uh, processes and mechanisms that we are dealing with as, as humans, uh, we work with organizations primarily, and we the, there is an assumption that that we are dealing with healthy populations. However, the same processes can be applied and can be uh, can be adjusted to different populations. And in my work, I all I worked with addiction in peripheral uh, domain when I was at Mount Sinai School of, of Medicine. It was in relation to risk taking and decision making in a very specific um, context of, of risk based decision making. So. The, I'm not sure how far the question is uh, or, or the person asking wants me to go in terms of explaining addiction, but there are there are commonalities between in terms of the what's happening in the brain from the physiology and, and psychology of the, of uh, addiction. There there is uh, there is a it's a scale between how we are as human beings as healthy. Uh, or as healthy as we as we think we are, as we progress uh, with whether it's alcohol or whether it's it's uh, substance or whether it's even um, other things that we are that that we are getting addicted to, it's a function of both the biology and also a construct and decision making processes that that we use. So it depends on the context within which uh, the question is posed. So for me to be able to answer it better, um, I, I think you answered it quite well and. And what we talk about and what we deal with and what we even teach uh, that is quite uh, contextually appropriate, uh, having that explanation. Um, actually, one of my classes, I talk about how um, I, I kind of explain the difference between being dependent on a substance and being addicted and how yeah. uh, adaptive patterns would, ha would happen in the hijacking of the brain. So I think you'd probably be excellent to actually explain how that hijacking happens and, and what happens there. Um, but for our topic here, I think it's probably important. Can you kind of get into the actual science of de-escalation? And one of the things you brought up earlier was uh, we teach it in our uh, our crisis response class. I talk about how um, there is an inverse relationship between uh, emotionality, I guess, if a word, and uh, rational thinking. So like, uh, just simply speaking, right, the more emotional a person is, the less likely that they're going to be uh, rationally or logically thinking. And I tell them that to look at that when they're dealing with the person they're dealing with, but also with ourselves, um, because it's we often find in, in when you're teaching de-escalation that officers have their own, uh, you know, trigger points. They don't like to be called names or they might get offended if they're challenged and they get, you know, escalated. I've also seen you know, it applies to all things. Uh, officers get super emotionally charged when they're in a fast, high-speed chase. They make stupid decisions, get into crashes. 
they'll hit somebody that's handcuffed because their own emotional charge is high. So can you talk about maybe that, uh, the neuroscience behind that, if you would? Yes, absolutely. And I think that you are, you are, you are absolutely right that it's, it's extremely rare that one person is really escalated and emotional and the other person is not in, in a, in a high stake situations. It requires quite a lot of uh, work and also emotion regulation that I know sometimes, uh, sometimes the word emotion regulation is already like, oh, I'm already regular. I, I know how to control myself. And it's, it's a lot of the times it's an illusion for us we think we are in a control in in control but but it's not our physiology would react and in when you think about first responders the level of threat and also threat response meaning the stress response that is accumulated over time and also from event to event unless you decompress from that you are just piling up and adding smaller bricks to to the reactivity so then something small can trigger you uh, as you mentioned like you know the, the the officer gets triggered and he doesn't even reg he or she doesn't register that they they got triggered by by something that happened three days ago but it resembled them somebody did or say something similar and that kind of like sets of that reaction from three days ago that they are manifest Thing right now so the the importance of understanding and regulating and trying to figure out what is what are my triggers as, a, as an officer are absolutely crucial because it's never just one way interaction right like we as humans we are feeding off of each other so if somebody else is stressed and and frustrated and escalated it's going to impact us and it's going to take work for for us to actually down regulate that reaction in a way that is that we can actually use some of the cognitive functions because the moment we are really charged emotionally it's almost like i, I try to use this metaphor that if you if you have a house on fire suddenly meaning that you know like you're really emotionally charged and and is the the metaphor is the house of fi on fire there is really no time from a like a procedural perspective to stop and de and deliberate uh, about okay so who set the fire how did it happen and what what is that we should be doing next no the reaction automatically would be to put out the fire first and then deal with all the all the uh, surrounding information and the same is with in terms of reactivity like if we are really emotionally charged the the brain the, the whole software and the whole hardware is dealing with trying to put out that fire and trying to offset some of the some of the processes to go back to this baseline so to speak so there is no time for the prefrontal cortex or not enough um it doesn't have enough voice, so to speak, to communicate to the to the lower structures that are that are reacting and prompting the the flight or fight response or threat response to come down, right? So the, it's almost like uh, there is no enough resources that we have to do both things at the same time, being logical and also reacting from a survival perspective. Those two systems don't work at the same time. They are related to each other and correlated to each other. So one can go up, one one can go down. The one important thing for us is uh, I always, whenever whenever I talk about it, sometimes people think about the CISO interaction, the the the, the you know like the moment you are emotional, you are going to be in the high C, the 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 C and the the prefrontal cortex is in the saw, but it's not exactly like that because no prior parts of the brain go to sleep or shut down completely. There is always level of activation is just some of the level of activation can be slower or not and while you train and while you understand your triggers it's going to be much easier to then come back and bring uh, bring the the voice of the reason and prefrontal cortex faster if you train yourself and if you understand what is triggering you then going blind and, and just assuming that you can handle the situation when the emotional charge will be happening but that's without the preparation and without understanding it's it's highly unlikely that it's going to be a rational it's going to be probably a charge equally charged reaction to what you think somebody else is doing and reacting to you so it's there's so many combinations that we can think of when it comes to um the the interaction between the logic and the emotional uh systems that are going to kick in one is slow the other one is fast right like the emotional reactivity is really fast it's instinctive and it's going to kick, kick in before we even are consciously aware of what's happening and this is the, the or the opposite is the 
rational, the prefrontal cortex that is guiding the executive function when we can think, when we can collaborate, when we can process and deliberate information, but that takes time and effort. So in situations of crisis, when you think from a survival perspective, we are not designed to, to deliberate, we are designed to survive. And, but that has consequences, right? In terms of uh, talking to another person, if we only react and not not are not able to bring back the the prefrontal cortex to be uh, loud enough for us to kind of like calm down the uh, there is a limbic so-called limbic system that is going to be quite quite reactive in in the stress situation, so the yeah. prefrontal cortex will be coming down if it can't speak, so to speak, or if it's if it whispers it's not going to be possible to balance out the system uh, to make rational decisions. Right. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, I think that alludes to another policy implication question that Elizabeth is asking. And uh, how could we apply that to the hiring process for people in law enforcement corrections? So I, I guess what it, it would be their way to measure or test if we can test someone, you know, they're, they're more likely to re react with the reptilian brain or maybe they just have, you know, they're, they aren't maybe using their prefrontal cortex the way we'd like them to, they haven't been trained to, or who knows, right? Maybe you can uh, allude to that using that. And real quick before sure. you go, I just think that anyone that's viewing this should qualify for a certificate after this episode, because yeah. I can tell you already, I'm learning all kinds of stuff, and you were worried about an outline. See, we're just going with it. This is <laughs> well, I love it. I love it. Sorry, go ahead. All right, so, so I think that when it comes to hiring, the one thing that we need to start and remember is that um, human brains develop at different, different parts develop at different, at different speed. And our prefrontal cortex, which is the most rational, quote unquote, and the one that is controlling our reactivity and our emotions develop the slowest. And that happens usually we are fully developed, I have fully developed prefrontal cortex around age of 26 which means that because that's the that's so late we are as you know when you think about teenagers and us growing up we take we are way more impulsive we are way more risk taking because there is not enough uh, inhibition that is coming from the prefrontal cortex and control uh, for our and our reactivity so i think that when it comes to hiring having that in mind would be the first step rather than hiring people who are at the age of 20 who are way who has a, quite a few years of develop development when it comes to their ability to control their emotions and the and their physiology uh, much more, then that would be the first step. Sorry, situations right during that development, we're putting them into like trauma, like exactly. Right? Yeah. So that would that was that would be my my second point that you know like because of that they are going through six five years of really intense stress and trauma and and really offsetting uh, some some of the the things that that really young officers are observing it's going to impact how they react it's going to imprint on on their emotional uh, reactivity but also the the way with which they are they will be making decisions going forward because it's so impactful, but there was no buffer on, they don't have enough buffer, so to speak, to manage that, that, that reactivity. Um, so that's, I think that the age of recruitment would be, would be really important to course correct for, uh, uh, based on the physiology and, and psychology, developmental psychology. The other thing I, I, I would imagine would be really important to actually test properly uh, do a lot of testing cognitive and psychological tests much more than just one one test uh, it, it's it, and just just let somebody go through it and also academies i think that before you go to you know like the hiring process there should be a hiring process that actually has checks and balances and i'm not, I'm not sure how much of that is already in place uh, and it, i think it differs from state to state to state state to state but there is the, the i would imagine more assessments from a psychological perspective to also to also assess how reactive somebody is based on also stressed tests so like in in the research we do stress tests uh we do study that like the impact of stress on your on your cognition on your decision making and and your irrationality and i think that that should be also part um 
that probably uh, simulations like Milo would be very good before even hiring happens, and then doing doing training af after the hire is already onboarded. Because uh, the one thing that it's uh, with a changing environment and developmental and also acquiring more experience, we are going to change. Like the, we are never staying the same. From from a from our psychology, we are always building blocks and shifting some of the paradigms. Sometimes it happens fast if there is a trauma. Sometimes if the trauma is smaller, it's built. It builds up. It's going to also change how that officer is progressing in in their um, in the work, depending on the experiences that 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 uh, he or she is having as they go through it. So it's multiple. I would imagine multiple steps. Age different testing that is more oriented towards psychology and reactivity and and also um continuous testing uh, uh, testing and, and checking as the uh, as the officers are going through their training on the job already so does answer, that answer your question to answer your question elizabeth everything that no one is doing yeah oh so i used to say we should we should up the age to 30. uh i've since come off and i said 26 but i think even at 26 you should have to have a four-year degree and you should at least have one year of working in some type of social services mm. if not because i think we need to learn communication skills without having a gun belt and i think we have to learn about the uh the effectiveness of conversation and how to listen to deal with people that are in maybe troubling situations before we're given all this power and authority yeah. so um, anyway, I appreciate you touching on all that. That was a great answer. Yeah. It was a very good answer. And so now um, a couple more here. Brianna is asking about EMDR. Uh, yeah. I've moved desensitization reprocessing for those that don't know. A very common therapy uh, for those people with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and from my experience uh, through the VA, it has a pretty... Um, pretty successful uh, treatment rate, whatever that means, but I know that they have pretty good outcomes. But specifically, uh, she's asking, can it assist in the natural reaction an officer can have to a trigger to prevent an excessive output response? Yes, I, I mean, absolutely. EMDR, it's, um, I would imagine it needs to be a part of, depending on the severity, uh, but sometimes even going, go, taking a step back, after every, or an accumulation of, of, of really, really severe in, um, traumatic event that an officer is going through, having, having not only a psychological help and going through, uh, through kind of like a debriefing, EMDR can be one of the, one of the tools that can be used more broadly rather than just after something that, that has happened that derailed an officer or, or it was extremely traumatic because the moment you... And it, it's important to know that sometimes for some people, depending on severity, one, two sessions can work. And for others, you would need to go through 10 sessions over a period of time because it's depending on how severe the the the, the memory and the emotional connection was, was built and then re-triggered and resurfaced and reconsolidated through the repeated uh, exposure, it may ha it may take different lengths and different depths of uh, of the treatment to actually uh, decouple that that reaction and it depends on severity but I, I i think that in principle it would be really important to to try that and incorporate that in 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 some of the sessions or debriefing sessions decompression sessions so the memory is not going to locked in in such a way that is that is then just because every time we we have a memory when when we register something all those information is kind of like spread out across your entire brain it's not just setting a file in one place of, of your brain so the moment every time I, we relieve that memory we the memory is actually vulnerable to manipulation so if we relieve that memory in again another traumatic experience it's only going to add severity to that memory so doing that with the EM, emdr and actually doing that in a in a control environment that you can re -con reposition the emotion attached to that memory through the through the emdr it's going to be much easier because then when that memory kicks in again it's not going to kick in with the emotionality that was there initially but it's going to kick in much more as a as a distance when it comes to um recollection and emotional uh, attachment that we have to that so uh, emdr yeah absolutely and this this more severe the more uh, it would be probably important to incorporate with some of the debriefing sessions 
Yeah. That's great. Elizabeth says, uh, head science. I call it juicy science. <laughs> um, and then, real, so yeah, Trini, love you, brother. Thank you for being here. He says, self awareness as police officers is huge. I used to talk to myself out loud during a high speed chase mm -hmm. to keep me calm, even though adrenaline was charging through. Yeah. Uh, and Tommy, you know, I think about how many thousands and thousands of officers are out there and have no idea about why they act the way they do. This kind of training is sadly just not a priority. I don't think our city leaders realize how important crisis training is. They're about to, Tommy. They're about to. Uh, and then Elizabeth says, congratulations, Cammy. You win the award for keeping our... <laughs> so well, we predicted this and we told her that early on because <laughs> yeah. she was worried that we didn't have a format. And we told her it was live and she's like, you knuckleheads are going to get me in trouble, but we promised. And it was addressing a point you were talking about earlier with the, um, the blocks that, you know, when we're, when we experience one event and we're like stacking these blocks where there's no decompression, there's no time to like restabilize before the next one specific to like coping or numbing rather like numbing and avoiding behaviors i think this is one of the big issues for people again not just specific to law enforcement i mean i think everything that cammy's talking about right now really relates to everybody absolutely at level but i think people when when they're stacking these blocks of trauma or stress or worry or fear or whatever it is instead of truly decompressing and like stabilizing to get back to let's say zero they will numb out or they'll avoid dealing with it based and, and and that's like maybe a maladaptive coping strategy or something like again through addiction or pornography or um you know terrible relationships whatever it is mm -hmm. and then they feel like okay i'm good to go and then they just keep compounding and compounding and compounding and there's never really any true like processing um so if you could and i know it's going to be different for everybody but specific to like how do you get back to that zero? Like other than just, I know it's going to be individual specific, but like, how do I like take those layers of bricks off to where now I can be fully engaged the next time I face this uh, stressful situation? Mm, yes. So you, you, you just threw me a, a quite of a big hot potato <laughs> on my lap in terms of um, how, how to tackle this, because it's a, it, it depends. So, you can't What's your favorite food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you can't change you can't force somebody to go through the same the same processes i think that there are there are uh, there are mechanisms that, that we need to we need to remember our natural tendency and it kind of like stems from from trying to the the defensiveness or trying to avoid and trying to distance ourselves is it's it's a, also it's a defense mechanism from a perspective of survival because the more you dig in into this we feel that and the more we sit with the negative emotions and sometimes it's actually looking in the mirror about okay i messed up some i messed up it wasn't the other person but that takes in some ways, courage to actually sit down and realize, okay, it wasn't them. I reacted, I overreacted, um, and then I did it again, and I did it again. So it requires uh, self-awareness. And I think that a lot of the times, um, because it requires self-awareness and because it requires actually actual effort, which is something that we, unless we need to, we we are not going to spend the time on because it's actually costly for us to do that, to to interrogate ourselves and try to figure out what is at the bottom of this. And also uh, as human beings, we are, sorry? Costly how? Like it's co energy, it? costly energy and costly when it comes to actually understanding, when it comes to like uh, um, metabolic effort that it needs to take for the brain to, to do that. The And that's a misleading, assumption that because it because it costs us it it makes us tired it feel and sometimes we are out of depth and we are not as good doing that ourselves because we are not objective that's why we go to therapy that's why we go to friends that's why we actually ask somebody else how did i show up did i actually did it did i say that or did i come across this because the moment we are emotionally unattached we are much better at actually finding what other people are doing this is when this is why we are very good at 
uh, telling everybody else what's wrong with them and what they've done wrong and giving them the feedback, but we don't see ourselves because we are too attached emotionally. So it's those two things are kind of like ingrained for us and then we keep identity, we keep face. So in the, the, in the processes when, when one tries to do it themselves, I think a lot of the times they would need to go through some some structure uh, that they can right now it's available uh, from so many different places when it comes to kind of like understanding the the, the mechanism and, and understanding emotion regulation because a lot of the times when you think about the building the bricks if we if we assume that we are good and it's like oh i'm not going to deal with this i'm just going to go to the next 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 argument i'm going to go to the do the next task and i and i'm still brewing uh in, in inside what's happening is that we are suppressing emotions and we know uh from research that naming the emotion or talking about the emotion actually takes the sting out because it releases it's kind of like it's an acknowledgement and validation but if we suppress it if we keep it really really tight it's going to blow up sooner or later it's going to blow up and it's going to blow up in a different context than the one that the emotion is actually about so so understanding that the suppression is not the way to go especially when in the context that you are dealing with uh, um, when you have actually weapons and when there is somebody else's life on the line it's not the same as it is, is shouting at somebody in the in the office even that is unacceptable but the consequences are different trying the understanding the impact of emotional suppression and not dealing with the with the anger is it's it's really important the first step to do that and i think that a lot of the times when people try to change or unpack something they try to jump and undo everything in one go. And it's I, I tend to think about it when you think about it, it's just like throwing a grenade and assuming that there will be rainbow. No, it's gonna be rubble all over the place and you are not going to know where to go. So taking right. one, se one step, one brick and just uh, kind of like breaking that brick is, is one step at a time. It's like one, one emotion at a time so you don't overwhelm yourself. And also when you do that, you can actually get the feeling of accomplishment when you do something small and it feels like oh i've got this actually i made this one step it feels better for us we actually get a like a reward response in in our in our system and it's we are building this upward spiral like small things where we go down rather than the other way around the downward spiral wow. is, that, is that dopamine, dopamine we get with the reward system it's dopamine, but it's also like other uh, other 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 agents <laughs> would be. Sorry. Other hormonal discharge. <laughs> other other horm hormonal, yes, hormonal reaction cascades. You oh, are getting, you are really stuck at the at the at the discharge, right? <laughs> it's just, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, that's he, great. He's gonna hold on to it for a while. Yeah. Gosh, uh, there was a lot to unpack there. Um, uh, but I did want to get back to something uh, that you mentioned. Well, first I want to say like. If you've taken our courses before, we haven't paid her to do this because she's making it sound like we know what we're talking about. Like that's just happening by accident. So that's the first thing I want to say. So I'm glad she's here. I feel really good. Yeah, yeah. You, you, we're on the right track. So you're validating a lot of the stuff that we do. So thank you. Awesome. Um, but but secondly, um, aside from hormonal discharge, um, you said something earlier. I think you were answering Brianna's question. And that was um, that there's different things that we could do uh, there's multiple things that we could do to deal with uh, trauma and stress. Um, and one of them was, uh, you mentioned debriefing. That was just something you threw out there. And a lot of officers don't do that. I think Elizabeth alluded to it, right? Like whenever you have a more specialized unit, um, they will. They're trained to. Like I know hostage negotiators or crisis negotiators usually do. Or SOU, they're, they're supposed to. You hear that. But the average officer doesn't. And as a matter of fact, I think that there's officers that will like take offense if you like try to talk to them offline. Hey, maybe you could have done something better or ego gets in the way. And then something else you said also was that, you know, having a yelling at each other in the office isn't good, but that's like different, like because we're dealing with weapons. And I found it interesting that in our line of work, that's like a normal behavior, like to have, like a supervisor and a not supervisor, like yelling at each other or people getting uh uh, riled up at roll call or you calling somebody out like uh, it, it leads me to think that we are highly stressful people in this profession like we're wound up for the wrong reasons all the time mm -hmm. and there's i think it was tommy that said it and and um Trini alluded to this that there's so many people out there that are doing this job for decades 
and they aren't even aware of this. So I, I think the implications and what, what this science could do for our profession is tremendous. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And Cammy, I, I, I have a question unless, and, and you can say what you're about to say and then tie this in if you don't mind. But um, I think specific to right now, and again, outside of just policing, but people in general, I, like, is there an explanation? And I, I hope I'm not throwing another hot potato at you, but this is like, <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of talking to my friend here. Um, but is there an explanation of why people fear change so much so other than like the ego because that's what i just i allow well, the ego is a big deal like the ego strong and people fear change but like what's really and I, and I get like through evolution and it's all like um survival based but in 2020 at like who knows what stage of the pandemic we're in if things are getting better or not the election season just the the disaster that's happening all around us in the external world if we turn on the tv but there's so much fear right now, I think, from people of the unknown, of what it's going to look like, and am I going to get back to work, and what are schools going to look like, and what's the election going to look like? Why does that create so much internal stress, change, or what is fear, if you can touch on that? Yeah, so I yeah, think that... So I think, oh, sorry, I, I hear myself. Um, I think that it depends. So when you talk about change and uncertainty are related so the fear that 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 we feel it's it, go, it goes back to uncertainty a lot of the times when we don't know what to expect or what would be the outcome of, of what we are doing is one of the preventing factor or, or deterring factor for us because we don't have enough information so this is why when we deal with you know like even thinking about uh, saving for retirement Right now, dealing with uncertainty and dealing with something that is so far ahead of us that we don't have the data points um, for, for our brain to process and to, to, to assume the predictability of the situation is giving us a lot of um, stress. And it's actually not a good feeling for us, a good state to be in a state of uncertainty. And a lot of the situations that we are dealing with are already compounding that effect because we tend to we tend to conflate certainty with familiarity like the things that are that that are familiar to us we think that they are certain but there is there is never certainty really for us as human beings right like we deal with uncertainty a lot this year everything is unfamiliar the pandemic the lockdown a lot of the situations that are highly emotionally charged everything went up to the surface in one year in a very different context for the entire world so suddenly we feel we feel really really heightened level of uncertainty like i don't know what what's going to happen and i and it's not something that we can get for ourselves easily unless we try to reframe and think about it more about the how much clarity i can get about something or how much how much do I need to know to be able to carry on and do the next step? So that's uncertainty and the fear correlation. When it comes to change, we don't, we fail at changing uh, all the time, right? Like think about the New Year's resolutions. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going. Not, I'm not going to smoke. I'm going to go to the gym seven times a week from January first. And because we don't know how behavior change actually happens we are going about it really the wrong way we tend to think that we're just going to do a few of those things and then it's going to just carry on by itself so we need to go back that that's one of the pieces also that that, that i'm teaching a lot about what is actually take what does it take to behavior change at scale with a lot of people but also in yourself and it's a lengthy process even though we as humans we change all the time small things we are adjusting but we don't think of it as change we tend to think of change as something really big and there are two ways that you can look at change uh, outside of understanding the process is one is uh, change as a threat so like i don't know it's the uncertainty driven that's the the stress it's going to be to be kicking in with that aspect of of, of perceiving change as a as a potential threat to us to our survival to our safety to our predictability but also as a if we, if we think about change as a challenge which is slight the reframe the 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 hormonal discharge would be different right like so thinking about thinking about the the athlete who is going to uh um, going to uh start 
let's say the 100 meter run, they are going to, to experience stress that is associated with this unknown, how I don't know how fast, uh, you know, how, how, how well I'm going to do, et cetera. It's called eustress. And the bad stress that we kind of like feel when something really we don't we don't know how to handle when we think about uh, threat is called uh, distress, and those are different ways that we can set ourselves up in terms of also physiology. The distress is more about physiological uh, fight or flight response that is going to kick in. So your your blood is going to be distributed differently than it is in the eustress. When you when you think about the change as a potential challenge, it's the different. There is a different component. One is energizing. The other one is more in terms of actually uh, trying to uh, to keep your survival more. And a lot of the times when especially if the change is forced on us, we are going to recoil. We are going to try to go back to the status quo um, because it's easier. The, the, the known devil is better than the unknown devil, so to speak. I think that that's the American saying. If, if not, maybe you can correct me. Uh, but it's kind of like for us, even the, that's why we, we tend to stay in bad relationships or bad friendships or bad jobs longer because it feels like, okay, we are, at least I know what I'm dealing with. And if I need to go out and try the new different things and face the old uncertainties, those are threatening for us from like a psychological perspective. So we shy from, 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 from actual change. One, it's effort. Two, it's perception. And second is the, the lack of or perceived lack of predictability. So, so it's a matter of reframing your mindset that, you know, a lot of the, I, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of, um, there is a lot about the growth mindset versus fixed mindset that is connected to that, that we can think about uh, linking it. So, so it's, it's, it's a multiple component, uh, components that we need to take into account um, when it comes to change in general. Does yeah. that answer your question or did I take you on that? <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. I love that. Like anytime there's forced change, we recoil. That's brilliant there. I mean, you stress, distress. I mean, it's, it's, I love it. And and it's like uh, Tommy says here, excellent question. He, he has the attitude of everything happens for a reason, right? So there's this like universal, just if it happened, it was always going to happen. Um, and then has his priorities. But for a lot of people, we get like attached to outcomes. And I think anytime we get attached to an outcome, or again, like you said, just because it's familiar, we think it's like either right, or it's certain, or it's like the thing, but it's actually not the case. And so, um, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm floating right now, Cammy. I'm feeling so happy. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> well, you, 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 on, like you, you make it sound smart. So I'm glad for that. <laughs> and, and there's actually like, reasons by why we teach the things. And it reminded me of something that someone said to me. And a lot of people have been, you know, coming up to me recently, um, very recently. And someone said something, right? Like I've been uh, a patrol officer this entire time. And the same shift, you know, I got lucky that my days off changes because of seniority, but um, this is all I've done. Because I've been afraid to like, go work for somebody else or like leave this area or go to another unit or change it all. Like, and you are just walking away from this career, you know? So it, it reminded me of that. Right. So uh, that feeder can be debilitating and it, it does, uh, you know, hinder growth. So yeah. uh, I'm glad you, you brought the science to it to kind of show like why that happens to us and how we got to get out of it. And so many of us in this profession are in bad relationships. We're stuck in, you know, unhealthy lifestyles and we just won't get out of it. And there's a reason for it. But um, we're about that time where I put you on the spot. So now it's my turn <laughs> to the potato. Um, you've been an excellent guest and we appreciate you answering our questions uh, so comprehensively. But if there's anything that you wanted to leave the audience with, if there's anything coming up for you, um, you brought up a lot of uh, the stuff happening around the world right now, anything that you want to talk about. Uh, that you want to close with uh, now would be the time so if you could please hmm. thank you thank you jesse uh, so i think that the one thing that i wanted to to uh to respond about um a lot of us saying uh, relating to change would be that sometimes we are not going to make the change if the pain of staying in this in this bad situation is not um is not strong enough to leave, we are going to stay. It's almost like the, the, there is a threshold 
for all of us that there is a breaking point like i cannot do this anymore there is a there and and that threshold is very different for different people so so it, it's a matter of understanding that as well that sometimes people are not ready to do that and and for whatever reason there, there may be one event that is going to to shift the scale or there might be still another se several so so it's it's a lot of this is about pain and pleasure and also learning and getting used to the the, the pain the the the, the feeling that, that, that we got used to it, the, the stress is also addictive in, in some way, that, that we just get used to it and we feel comfortable with it. And anything outside of that zone, out, especially if it's going to be less pain, sometimes can, can come across as, oh, I'm just bored. This new thing is not, is not as exciting to me as, as, the, as the old pain, even though I don't like the old pain, but it's, it feels like it's more engaging. So it, it's important also to to try to register that whether that can be potentially happening. Um, and I think that that kind of brings me to the, I was thinking the whole time about what is the, what is the quote? What is the, the one thing that I, that uh, I could leave and that I also think about um, almost every day, especially right now. I think that it's uh, actually Maya Angelou uh, quote uh, that she used to say, um, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And I think that for me right now is even, this is probably the most pronounced one. Like we do know how to do better and, and we still are not rising to that. But it's, it's, it's a matter of, of, of process. And, and so like do better, you know better, do better. And I think that would be something that I would leave the audience with and everybody. <laughs> Cammy, if you were a awesome. library book, I would never return you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Oh man, uh, what a what a great guest. Um, it, I'm I'm at a loss because I I, I left I, you speechless, guys. What? <laughs> I, left you present, I heard you present and it was good, and I knew you were smart. And Joe's been like I said, he's been fan growing for a while since he's been working with you. And I think that we're so benef like blessed to, to have this science kind of start bleeding to us now because I don't think there's anyone that needs it more. Everyone does. And I think that we have this beautiful trifecta, right? We got the triangle of you know, you and your organization, right? Milo range, and then us. So we have, you know, science, we have a simulation, and then we have practical application all, all together. And I think that the the, uh, the policy implications of this are endless and it's beyond because in a world like we get stuck in how do we teach the escalation right how do we promote behavior change but just listening to you talk there's so many things that we could do to help um first responders it, it it's it, i could go on forever like my mind is blown from this uh one one uh, episode so thank you for for joining us and bringing that you you really uh brought it home now what i want to say is um a lot of people have been wishing me well. Uh, I had, uh, I hadn't had any moment at all recent. People were like, "Are you nervous? Are you scared? You know, what, what are you excited?" And uh, I gotta say, like, there's so much work going on that between like what was my work at work and everything that we have to prepare for and everything we're doing and we're trying to grow, uh, and then family. Like in that space, I didn't have an opportunity to feel anything. And yesterday, uh, after writing my farewell post because so many people were asking me questions because it was starting to show up in other feeds. Like people were wishing me well or and like we're hearing rumors and they were trying to um, understand it. And this says a lot, right? The, the fact that I was leaving was probably from what everyone I spoke to that knew me, it was mind blowing to them. They were unprepared and they just could not see how this could happen. Um, and I think that's why uh, some of the things that were brought up today were so important. I believe that um, what happens next is going to be great. I just, I just believe it, and I know it will. And it may not be easy. It may be difficult, but I have total faith in, in this and us and, and what's coming. I also know that I work hard, and I've, my whole life I've learned that, you know, you may not be the smartest person. You may not be the strongest. You may not be like, you know, the best looking or whatever, right? Look at me. But if you are 
the hardest working person in the room and you are the most passionate and you always have good intentions and you take care of people, everything works out in the end. So I'm super uh, grateful for that. I did have my first emotional moment when I wrote that post last night and I was overwhelmed by the response. So even with um, the kind of uncertainty or like questioning that I got all week, yesterday was a really, really cool um feeling so everybody i've ever worked with i thank you everyone that that's you know wished me well and believes in in me and joe and, and believes in what we're doing i thank you and i'm, I'm excited and i am uh, looking forward to the future with so much hope i'm very hopeful and uh conversations like these are just opening up um so many uh thoughts and plans and and uh, i know that good things are coming and we got good people on our side so thank you all for this amazing ride. Thank you to that, to the San Francisco Police Department for what it's given me and everybody that works there. And for all my friends and mentors and family and, and that stuck with us, everyone that watches us every week, um, it, things are getting better. Things are going up and uh, I can't wait for you to see it. And I, I, I was speaking with Michelle about this and I said, I was looking at the post that I had written and I'm watching it, you know, all the likes, all the comments, it was flooded. And I thought to myself, my vision and my goal is one year from now, I want that memory to pop up on Facebook and I want, I'm anxious to see how I'll be feeling. Like I want that moment to say like, I remember I was feeling that way. I remember that I was sad and that I was kind of nervous and I didn't know, you know, there was uncertainty, but just like our good uh, doctor and professor just said, if you are a slave to that uncertainty and to that fear, there is no growth. And I know that growth is coming and you all are going to get to see it. And thanks for being with me. Uh, Joe, what you got? <laughs> Sound effects for you. Oh, man. We got a new toy, by the way. Yeah. That was beautiful. Uh, usually I will end with a quote, but I'm not going to today because Cammy had a beautiful one that was just so perfect for this episode. And um, I'm just going to end it in gratitude. And uh, Jesse, this is your day and your moment. And I'm grateful that you are coming alongside with me because I believe in what we can do together. Cammy. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of a Saturday to do this and just share like one 97th of one tenth of uh, knowledge that you have floating in your head uh, with our audience. And I want to share this far and wide because I think it's important, again, not just for first responders, but, but for people. I mean, I, I was watching some of the comments on here and people that are just feeling connected to uh, to what you are saying. So uh, thank you for taking the time to give back to the people who love us and follow us. And I would love to do this again. And, and maybe we'll have a structure a little bit or an outline, but I think that's great. Uh, Cause here's what I know. If we ask you one question, we're going to get a full answer. And I love, I love that. that. So, uh, and there's no tap dancing. It's like, that was fluid. So you're brilliant. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much. And everyone that tuned in, thanks again. We will see you next week. We're going to be doing the next three weeks from Iowa. Hotels. Um, we'll be doing it from hotels. So the production is going to be wonky. Work with us. But we're committed to keep doing them. Um, Cammie, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, guys.